Revelation chapter 3. At the end of the chapter in chapter 3, we come into a church, and I've been talking on the seven churches. Hopefully by now you'll be able to label those seven churches. We have the church of Ephesus, and the problem with Ephesus is they what? They lost, they lost their first love. After they lost their first love, the second church comes into it, and the second church is what? Smyrna. Very good. Whoever said that? Okay, Smyrna means myrrh. It had to be crushed. And that church that he speaks to there had to be crushed. And in history, we're getting ready in a week from now, we're getting ready to talk about the history of the church and exactly how this pulls together. Because I want to pull it all together in the end and show you what the Lord has actually revealed to us through all of this. From there, we got Pergamos, Thyatira, we got uh, uh, Philadelphia, or Sardis, Philadelphia, and then Laodicea. Or if you're, if you're in the country of Turkey, it's Laodicea. And they will correct you. <laughs> Talking about that church today, I honestly believe that we as a church in America are not, we all want to be the Philadelphia church, but I don't believe that we are. I believe that we're more of a Laodicean in church. But before I talk to you about it, I want to pray about it. Lord, I pray that everything that I say will come from you. I don't want to put it out there, Lord God, without it being you. So I pray that the things that need to go out, send it out. The things that don't, then don't. I pray, Lord, that you will check our hearts today. You'll let us know, Lord God, the things that we either need to change or the things that we need to improve on, the things that we need to absolutely stop doing. But I pray that you'll help us, Lord, because the last thing we want is to be lukewarm. So bless everything that is said and done, please, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I look around this body. I have seen a Laodicean church for, I've been pastoring this church for 30 years. And um, I've seen a lot of Laodicean people, lukewarm. They're not hot. They're not cold. If you were hot, that would be absolutely great, okay? You would be in ministry, and you would be rocking. If you were cold, at least you would admit that I really need Jesus. I'm cold right now. But lukewarmness is a horrible thing to be. Lukewarmness puts you in a position where I am not hot and I am not cold. I'm okay right where I am. And because of that, the Lord says, you ready for this? You make me sick. Okay? He's going to spew, which means to vomit what the word means he's going to vomit you out of his mouth so as we get into this particular church I want you to realize something right off the bat because every church right off the bat he says I know your works and then he says something good about him but this one there is nothing good that he says about this church nothing that's horrible the church in America, we are at a split right now. You got the Philadelphia church and the Laodicean church. And that remnant that came up, okay, chronologically for 2,000 years, we now had that remnant that came up. We had what's called the Reformation. The Reformation came up. Here we are. I believe that we're at the end of this called Reformation. And now the coming of the Lord is at hand. And I believe that. And I believe that if the Lord is coming and he's coming quick, we can either love God with all of our heart, we can love one another as God would love us, or we could fall into Laodicea, which means rule of people. And you need to ask yourself, do you want to dictate what God is doing? Or do you want God to dictate? That's the difference in the churches. If you love God, you say, tell me what to do. I'm in it. The Laodicean church, God, let me tell you what I'm going to do. 
Notice the difference. And it happens all day, every day, in most churches in America. The churches in America have been spoiled for so long. Now, there's nothing good to say about this church. So I have to ask myself, is this church even saved? If the Lord can't even find anything good to say about them. But I want you to recognize that they think they're good. I know your works. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew a male vomit. I'm going to vomit you or spew you out of my mouth. Now, to spew you out of his mouth meant that at some time you were a part of him. Think about that. And now he's getting rid of you. Why? It actually upsets his stomach. I had a young lady I used to really, really, really like uh, lasagna. And for those houses I've been to that you serve me lasagna, don't worry, because I learned to like it again, okay? Everybody's going, oh no, I fed him lasagna when he came over. Listen, everybody feeds you lasagna. I figured that out. It's, I don't know why, it was just God teaching me a lesson. But she sat across the table from me. There's many different types of cheese in this lasagna. And a little girl, I don't know how old she was, eight, she decided to projectile vomit across the table. And as fast as I can move my head, it went <laughs> And I had something called neuroadaptation take place. And if you know anything about neuroadaptation, okay, what I loved for years, I now hated. And for a long time, I would try to eat lasagna because I knew in my head, this is stupid, just eat it, force yourself. You know that you love lasagna, so eat it and don't whine about it. And I'd get it to my lips And my stomach's going, I dare you. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. That's what sin should do to us. Because the holy vessel, or a holy spirit, and the holy word that is inside of you, that created a new person in there, okay, is saying, no. No. It makes me sick. I can't do this. And that lasagna, I, I did not even have to eat it. If I smelled it, we were on a bus. Joe Root was the bus barn guy at the time. That's before our Joe took it over for 30 years. And um, he had a driver that was up there, and he was, he was a good guy. He made little things out of wire that he used to give to us with your name on it and stuff. I don't know how he did it, but he was, he was a good guy. But Larry Nixon was on that bus. I don't know if you know Larry Nixon. If so, tell him I told the story. Larry Nixon got sick. He was about three quarters away in the back of the bus. He got sick. As soon as he got sick, there was this smell that it went through the back of the bus. And the guy behind him got sick. And the guy beside him got sick. And all I had to do was go. And it was done. I decided to join the crowd. If you can't beat them, join them. And I did. And we all got sick now this is where the people that run these buses this is where they earn every penny 
because somebody had to clean that up. Wasn't me, man. Wasn't me. Joe, I don't know, he had to do that for years or had somebody do it, but it, you got to understand that what the Lord is saying is there is something that I smell, something that I see, something that I can't put up with. It absolutely, I can't get you close to me without, I'm getting, I'm getting sick. Now, do you know what it would take for a God that created you and loved you so much? The patience and the long-suffering, the gentleness, the kindness, the meekness, the temperance, all of these things that the fruit of the Spirit really is. He, he was hanging on to all of this, just waiting for Renee to finally, but Renee kept get, going out there and going out there until finally it became a stench in his nostrils. And that stench of being lukewarm, you know, you could cook something and preserve it longer. We got to cook it before it goes bad, right? So we cook it or we freeze it. Well, you leave it in the lukewarm and you're in trouble. And that's exactly what the Lord is saying. Listen, you're starting to stink. You are a stench to my nostrils. You're an eyesore in the church. And when I get close to you and I try to get close to you, you do nothing but do something that just makes me, oh. You know, there was a time, Exodus 30 through 32, there was a time where God just wanted to take care of, really quick, he just wanted to take care of Israel. Just let me, he said, just let me kill them. I'm going to waste them all. They're making me so sick. All they do is murmur, complain, bellyache. They want it out of Egypt. I got them out of Egypt. I want to get them to the other side. It wasn't that long. I want to get them to the promised land. But I can't get them to stop whining. Isn't that awful? And so he told Moses. Moses went out and he told Moses. He said, Moses going to destroy him. I'm going to hurt him. Moses said, Lord, i tell you what. Now, this is called intercessory, and I have never known anybody, and I am not there either. This is, this is a true intercessor. But Moses told the Lord, Exodus 32, 33, 32, or 32, or 33, one of those. And he was talking to the Lord. He said, Lord, I'll tell you what. Why don't you take my name out of the book and put all of them in? In other words, if it takes me losing everything I got and burning in hell, I would rather burn in hell to have all of them that you put in my responsibility burn in hell. Whoa! You see, the Lord made you my responsibility to pray over you, to do what I can to help you, and, and that would be like me going, Lord, listen, I'll burn in hell if you'll save all of them. I'm not there. Okay, pray for me, Darren. I'm just not there. You want to burn in hell? That's your gig. That ain't mine, man. I ain't going there. So, I want you all to realize something. In that whole thing that they were doing, he was able to talk to the Lord. And that relationship was good enough. He spoke to, the Bible says that Moses spoke to God as a friend face to face. Wow. To change the heart of God must be an incredible feat. But you got to think of where his heart was that he could actually talk to the Lord at such and be able to change the heart of God. Lord, I really, I love these people and I am so sorry from them to you. And the Lord saw that. And the Lord saw it. But here's what did happen. 
He never, there's only two people. Two people that made it into the promised land. Everybody else died in the desert. All of the original people died in the desert. Their children entered the promised land. But they could not. They could not. Why? You see, there was a lukewarmness. They weren't thankful. They had no gratitude whatsoever. And all they did was whine about their situation when they're the ones that put themselves in it. All the time. All the time. Now listen to what they, listen to what we in America say. Because thou sayest, I am rich and I am increased with goods. I don't have need of anything. That's what they were saying. Now, if you go to Ledokia over in Turkey, you will go there and you will find that these chariot wheel tracks are going along these, these uh, marble ways. And along the edge, you find these colonnade. And there's temples and the residential part is way over here. And you got all these temples right here. And when you passed in the colonnade, there's all these statues of all of these people that were absolutely wealthy that lived in Ladokia. But in 60 AD, there was a big earthquake. And the big earthquake took it all down. And you can see it today, exactly what happened. They're trying to put her back together. But it took it all down. All the statues came down, busted everything up. And the governor sent word to Ladokia and said, we want to help you to put everything back up because that was obviously uh, when you do a lot of trade with certain cities, you want them to get back up as soon as they can because you're going to need them, their help, and their money. So let us help you put it back together. And they sent a message back to the governor and the message said, and this is what this is referring to right here. It says, we are are rich and we are in need of nothing and that's what he is saying you have never depended on me because you've got cash in your pocket you think that cash can get you out of your situation why because it worked for george soros let me tell you something about that and i'll say it right from here george soros is an evil man Pelosi is an evil woman. The Clintons, they're evil. Look at, you could, you could track them. Everything in their trail has destruction. And yet they're helping lead the United States. And all of the people that would like to say, I will take money from George Soros to run for my campaign. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You don't need any of that money. None of it. We, we are sick and tired of trying to bow down to where the money's coming from. And this city said, we are in need of nothing. We are wealthy. Okay? They built it all back up. As soon as they built it all back up, it was totally completed. And anywhere from two to five years, depending on what you read, another earthquake took it all out. Everything they put together. He says to them, you say that you're rich, you're increased with goods, you have need of nothing, but here's what you need to know. You are wretched. You are miserable. Well, I mean, that's... <laughs> and then he says, you're poor. The word poor right there means a beggar. You're a beggar. You just don't know it yet. When do you think they're going to finally realize it? Was it while they were in their city with all their money? Or is it going to be standing before God in the end? And what do you think they're going to be begging for? He says, you think you're rich. You will find out you're a beggar. And you'll have so much shame in your nakedness, which means you will be totally exposed George Soros will be totally exposed in the end.
for who he is and the evil that he is, him and his father. Well, his father was the main one. But when all the Jews were being persecuted, they were taking over all of the houses of the Jews. Literally, they would lock them up and all of the stuff inside of those houses, if it was uh, famous art or jewels, it went straight to the Reich. It went straight up the, up, the, up the line. And the rest of it, the rest of it was gathered by Mr. Soros. He made his money off of the persecution of the Jews. And he said, George said, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it. He says, I can make a country, I can break a country. You know what? You may break a country, but you never take away from this freedom that we have as Christians. Amen? So he says to them, you're poor, you're blind, you don't see nothing, and you're absolutely naked. And he said, you know, the shame of that nakedness is going to catch up with you. So what to do about it? This is never anywhere in Scripture ever quoted like this. It's just in this one spot to this particular church. What to do? Uh, I'm going to counsel you. I'm going to give you some really good advice. I want you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Now, wait a minute. I want you to buy of me gold tried tried in the fire. What can you buy from God? You can't buy your salvation. That ain't possible. So what are you going to buy, which means to purchase? How are you going to get it? How are you going to get it? Mary just, Mary just said it. You're going to go through trials to get it. He said, in order for you to, that thou mayest be rich, you're going to have to buy of me gold tried in the fire. And that's so you can wear this white raiment. See, this white raiment is the righteousness of Christ. You can't get to heaven without it. And so the only way you're going to get to heaven is somehow that one statement, you're going to have to buy of him gold tried in the fire. And we're going to discuss that in a minute. And that the shame of your nakedness, remember, he calls him naked. He says that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear because if it does appear, you're going to see who you really were and you were not in a position to stand before a holy God. The church in America, at best, is very weak. Very weak. And he says, I want to anoint thine eyes with eye salve that you can see because you don't see. At the end of every church, all seven churches, then he ends with their ears. I want you to hear what the Spirit would say to the churches. I don't care what man says. I don't care what you think. I want you to take the Word, read the Word, and ask, ask the Holy Spirit to teach you and rightly divide that Word. Use it. So he says, I'm going to anoint your eyes with eyes have so you can see. And I want you to hear what the Spirit would say to the church. Now the outcome in Revelation 3, 19. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke. Whoa. <laughs> and chasten. No matter how you look up chasten, it is a discipline that hurts you. Okay? Okay. And so for you to get there, he's going to discipline you in a way that hurts you. Why? Because you are a slow learner. We are slow learners. Not just you, we. There's an evilness and a presence in this world that is evil at its core. I said it in the first service. I will say it in the second service. There is something going on in our nations where it's no longer Democrats and Republicans. It's not. Let me tell you something. 
this conservative and this liberal. It is no longer these two people that uh, their morals meet somewhere in the middle. It One is evil, one is good. One kills unborn kids. One don't care about heterosexual marriage. One don't care if you literally clip a, a, a boy when he's a boy and make him a girl. What is wrong with us? It is satanic. All the way to its core. And they're breeding it in your children. Your children are being raised up to think that this is a norm. And they're going to think that mom and dad were weirdos. And grandma and grandpa, you are way out there. When in all actuality, it goes directly against the word of God, the principles of God, the morals of God. And it will destroy the whole generation. Destroy it. Destroy it. But you see, I don't think that that has to happen. I think that there are Christians that actually love those people. And I think if we love on them, and we share the love of Jesus with them, because inside, they already know. You don't, even, you don't have to beg them. You don't have to. They know. They absolutely know, folks. The problem is, is they don't like them. You can love them, but how do you get them to love them? That's a different thing. This church right here is broken. It's not even a church. It's, 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 it's a religious organization ruled by what I want it to be, not what God wants it to be. So that I rebuke and I chasten, be zealous, therefore. At what? What do you want me to do? Repent and do it real and do it honestly. I want you to repent. Okay, Lord, I'm sorry. That's not repenting. I want you to repent. I said I was sorry. Really? You forget what God judges. He judges the heart. I'm sorry, Lord. Don't tell me you're sorry. You have plans on doing it tomorrow. You've already made the appointment. I'm sorry, Lord. Hogwash. You're going to walk out with the same lie you came in with. I'm sorry, Lord, but. I'm sorry, Lord, but. Where's Christ in this church? I want to remind you that the scripture to born again believers that, that are going to get saved. He says, knock, knock, and the door shall be opened to you. You seek and you'll find. You ask and it'll be given to you. But all of it is on you. He already did everything. He already said it is finished so now he asks you go ahead and knock go ahead and ask go ahead and seek go ahead I'm right here but not to this church look at this church Revelation 320 and we always quote that for a soul winning scripture but I, I want you to realize something he's telling it to a Laodicean church and where is he on the outside he's not in it and he says, behold, this goes back to Luke chapter 12, 35 through 38. Or I should say Luke 12, 35 through 38 in my Bible. It's on this side. <laughs> behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. And that is to a Laodicean church. He's on the outside still knocking to get in. And he says the same thing to the watching servant in Luke chapter 12, 35 through 38. That watching servant. And remember what he says. Blessed are them. Well, let me, let me go back a little bit. First of all, it says that when the Lord returns from the wedding and finds them watching, he said, blessed all the, are those servants if he comes in the second watch or in the third watch and finds them watching. You can look it up yourself. Luke 12, 35 through 38. Everybody kind of passes right over that. He already returned from a wedding, already got married. So he comes back. And when he comes back, then we find that Revelation 3.20 is right there. 
And he actually tells that church, I will come in to them and I will sup with them. And they're going to sup with me. And it's the same thing that he says to a Laodicean church. This Laodicean church is going to go through hell to get to heaven. Oh, they're going to have to buy of them gold tried in the fire, all right. You want to go through hell to get to heaven when it's a free gift? If it's a free gift, you wouldn't have to buy anything. <laughs> Salvation's free. So why are there martyrs? You see, you're not going to be able to buy. You're not going to be able to sell up and coming without a mark of the beast. If you take the mark of the beast, then you're out. So you won't be able to buy nor sell. And if you do decide that you're going to do something, you'll be beheaded for it. You'll be killed for it. And it's the same thing. That's what he's really saying right here. I'm on the outside trying to get in. And if you want to buy me gold tried in the fire, which I'm going to go over explicitly in just a second, then you just keep doing what you're doing. And then in 321, to them that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, sat down with my father in his throne. So can you overcome from it? Yes. For the sake of time, I'm going to go here. How do we buy from the Lord? Well, first of all, I counsel thee. That's, let me give you some advice. You that are poor, you that are blind, and you that are naked. We're supposed to be poor in spirit. So if you are a millionaire, keep your spirit poor. This is the counsel you to buy of me without money, without price. Gold purified in the fire. This is true living faith, which is purified in the furnace of affliction, and you will go through it. So I'm going to counsel you when you're told that if you don't deny your Lord, I will kill you right here and your children. It says you stay true. You stay to the living faith because that furnace of affliction is now upon you. Why? Because when I offered it you for absolutely free, you didn't take it. Why? Because you were spoiled little kids. Israel, for its day, spoiled little kids, whining and belly aching. The, and white raiment, which means true holiness and eye salve, spiritual awareness, illumination, where the unction of the Holy Spirit can teach you everything that you need to learn. You want to grow up? That's the way to do it. Allow the Holy Spirit to grow you up. See, this is the church that made God sick. The church made him sick because of this. They had to go through... Uh, because of all the sin that they were in, they had to go through whatever they needed to do to teach them. What do you have to go through? Prison, jail, divorce, somebody dying. David, he lost his son over his. What is it that we have to go through? Which church are you? I'm going to have to be closing, but I want to know which church are you? Are you a church that's lost their first love? Get it back. Are you a church that is going through the trial that the next that Smyrna went through? And if so, last the trial. Hold on fast to those things which God has given you. And when you come out of it, don't be a church that is legalistic. Don't be a church of Pergamos that says mixed marriage where you marry yourself to a religion. Don't do it. And never marry yourself to the state or the government to try to run the church. Never. And that is what our forefathers knew. They absolutely knew that that was going to be tried. And they said that the government cannot ever tell the church what to do. Can't do it. And that's what this church will not allow. 
the government to tell us what to do. I won't have time right now to go through what I, I did even in the first service, but I'm going to read something to you really fast. And these are just the instructions to the church, just so you're aware. And I want you to put these in the back of your mind. The things that he liked. He liked their labor. He liked their patience. In other words, you worked hard and you were patient in trying to bring people to the Lord. You waited on me. You didn't put up with evil. You found the hypocrites that were in the church. You know who they were. You did not faint in your well-doing. Their faithfulness and tribulation and poverty Yet, they were rich. They held fast to his name. They never denied the faith. They had charity. They had works. They had faith. They had service. Their works were even getting better. Their works had, uh, their works, again, in another church, they had little strength in the end, but they kept the word, and they did not deny Christ. Those are all the things. That's seven churches put together on the things that were liked. The things that were disliked. I don't like it when you lose your first love. The blasphemy of them that say they are a part of God's elect, but actually they're of the church of Satan. Some that hold the doctrine of Balaam, which ate things sacrificed to idols, committed fornication, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Those were one that basically turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. I can do whatever I want to do. God's fine with me. God is not fine with us, folks. He's not fine with America. You need to know that right now. They suffered that woman Jezebel who seduced the servants of the Lord to commit fornication. We are in the day right now where the Jezebel spirit is all over the place and it's welcomed in the church. The fornication, the adultery, sleeping together, staying together. Listen, I, if you want to come to church, you come to church, but don't pretend that I am going to think that it's okay. That's all. I want you to receive Christ. I just don't want you to think that I'm okay with you doing it. If I love you, I'm not going to be okay with you doing it. It says that they thought they were alive, but guess what? They were dead. He hates a lukewarm life. And he doesn't like it when you say you're in need of nothing because that way he's included in on it. What to do? Here's what to do with all seven churches. Remember where you came from. Repent. Go back to the first works that you did. You want to know what to do? How to get that back? Go back to the first works. Go start to witness to somebody. Take some groceries to a woman with some children. Repent. Well, what? I'm going to fight against you with a sword. When he does that in the end, you're not going to want to be there. But he literally says to that church, if you don't repent, that two-edged sword's coming at you. That which you have, I want you to hold on to. Remember what you learned. Hold fast. I want you to repent. Again, repent is used often. Hold that fast. Don't let anybody take your crown. Buy of him gold tried in the fire. Anoint your eyes with eye salve. Be zealous. Repent. Open the door so Jesus can come in. And that's what it says. The reward in these seven churches, you get to eat of the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. You won't be hurt in the lake of fire. You get to eat of the hidden manna. You're given a white stone, which means you're innocent, and your name is written in that stone that the Lord knows. You have power over the nations. You get to rule with a rod of iron. They'll get the morning star. Everybody knows the morning star is Jesus. A lot of people, uh, your translations, will even relate that to Satan. I rebuke that, too. All of these things that are written right here are the rewards you're going to get for your works. You're going to be clothed in white. Your name isn't going to be blotted out of the book. Con he's going to confess your name before the Father. You'll be a pillar in the temple of God. He's going to write upon him the name of God and the name of the city of God, which is New Jerusalem. And you get to sit with Christ in your throne, in his throne. So that is absolutely powerful. Now we're going to start going into the next part of it. <laughs> Somebody's tired. It's a bummer when you're a preacher and you hear people go, oh. I'm done, okay. Would you bow your heads with me? Church is not a game. 
And church is not a religion. You're the church. The church is the people. That's all. It's not this building. And this group of people is all over the world. It's not just Americans. It's not just Canadians. It's not a bunch of Mexicans. It's people all over the world. And he's trying to draw those people to himself. But today, people work out of lust, out of pride. Their whole lives are being shattered right in front of them. And, and from right, I'll guarantee you, it's going to get really bad. But I'm telling you, hold fast. You know whether or not you're lukewarm or not. You know whether or not you have been hot or cold. And I don't want to waste a bunch of time, so I'm going to ask you just point blank today. If you feel that you have been lukewarm, while every head is bowed, the eyes are closed. If you have been lukewarm, I, w- I would like you to raise your hand. Be honest with you and God. Lukewarmness. Just keep your hands up for a minute because what I'm going to do is I'm just going to scan over you because I just want to know who you are. You've been lukewarm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You can put your hands down. It's time. It's absolutely time to be either hot or cold. You do not want to be spewed out. You know that you're called. The Lord would tell you that He loves you so much. He's going to fix the wrong. He's going to make it right. And he's going to give you that chance. He is the God of second and third chances. But he wants you to submit yourself before him and let him do it. And if you're here today and you say, I've got to do this. I cannot be lukewarm anymore. I need to start doing something for the kingdom. That's why I'm not progressing. I'm not doing anything for the kingdom. I'm doing it for me. And the Lord said, if you want to do it for you, you keep doing it for you. But if you're going to do it for you, you're going to go through hell to get to heaven. And so those people that would like that, some prayer, I would have those people to just come and just I want you just to line up in the front if you want if you just want prayer over your lukewarmness you can line up right in the front if you want don't let pride stop you if pride is is, (laughs) if pride is holding you back then you're in a worse position A lukewarmness is a scary place to be. Especially when you know the truth. For the congregation out there, I would just have you to, if you would, please, just stretch your arms out towards the ones up here. They're being serious. And for the ones that are sitting in your seats, if you would like, you could get on your knees where you are. You could come up here. But I just want you to be real before God and very sincere before God that if you really want it, you really need it, then this is your time to get it. Lukewarmness is nothing to play with. It is a fire that will absolutely kill you. Lord, I pray for everyone that is up here. There's so many young ones up here. And I ask for you to bless them, watch over them. I pray, Father, that you would touch them right where they are right now. This is a serious thing, Lord God, for all of them. They know that we know of Christ, 
but we're not doing anything about it. Lord, I rebuke that lukewarmness and I ask, Lord God, that you put a fire in their bones that cannot be quenched. I pray, Lord God, that there is a cord within them, Lord God, that will absolutely uh, connect with you, Lord God, and it will become a cable that they cannot even cut. I pray, Father, that in front of them that you will give them vision so they would not perish. I pray in front of them, you'll allow them to see. Put an eye salve over their eyes. Allow them to see. There's so many people that are blinded today. It says that you're the one that actually put the blindness on them because they didn't want to believe the truth. They would rather believe the lie. Lord, we're tired of the lies. Today we stand in truth. I know what's right and wrong, and I don't need anybody to tell me what's right and wrong. I know what's right and wrong. I need the ability to do it. And so, Father, give us the ability, give us the discipline, give us the heart, give us the mind of Christ to be able to accomplish what needs to happen. I pray, Lord God, that you will put the families back together. Put them back together. Some have not worshiped together for a long time. I pray, Lord God, that families would start to worship together. To be with their heartache. Oh, Lord, there are so many in here, and the more I counsel, the worse it gets. And when I find out how many were actually, they were raped at four years old nine years old, 11 years old, changed their life radically. Of course, the damage, Lord God, that the world has done to them, I ask, Lord God, that you take that damage right now. Let them know that is under the blood of Jesus Christ. It's been erased from them. It no longer exists in them. It becomes a part of their testimony. It is no longer a liability. It's an asset in their life that they could use to be able to minister to somebody else. Pray that their minds, Lord God, would be clean to the things, Lord God, that they have seen, the things that they have done, the things that they have thought about. Let it be rebuked in the name of Jesus and cleanse their mind, cleanse their heart to not want it anymore. And may their desires, Lord God, be on you. May they have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Please, Lord, when they walk away today, let none of them be the same. Lord, here we are expecting miracles so give us faith Lord God our lives are going to be different today we're done with the past signs and wonders will follow them to believe and so father today we give you our life take us forgive us Lord God from all the raunchy garbage that has been in our life forgive us for all of that Lord today we are set free we're set free I am no longer going to participate in the Jezebel spirit and the spirit of Baal. Lord, we're done with all of that. We're done with being seduced by media, by books, by our phones, by, Lord, we're done with that. Lord, please forgive us. Discipline us, Lord God. Chase those and rebuke us, Lord God, because I know that you love us. But today, Lord God, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.